Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Gregory D. Leptuk fourth online Giovanni workshop. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It's 2 p.m. Eastern time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Today, we continue the Giovanni workshop with our third webinar, which will cover two topics, the current state of Giovanni in 2019 and a presentation of the new images that have been selected into the Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. Before we begin, let's quickly go over just a couple of logistics related to today's webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod, and you'll see that located on the right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. Excuse me. The recording will be posted to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. Once this has been completed, what I'll do is I'll send an email to all registrants with both recording links. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long, with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Once our speaker for today has finished with his presentation, we will transition to a final optional set of polling questions. And we'll usually give these questions three to four minutes or so, and then from there we'll move directly into the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes from end time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. Today's speaker is Dr. James Acker, the workshop organizer and a senior support scientist at NASA's Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or Jeff DISC, and that's located here at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, he will begin today with a tribute to Gregory G. Leptuk and then discuss, again, the state of Giovanni in 2019, and then we'll transition uh, to the second half of the webinar, which will focus on the new images that have been selected for the Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. Today's Q&A session will be moderated by my co-host, Joshua Blumenfeld. Um, thank you, everybody. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. James Acker. Dr. Acker? OK, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sounds good, Jim. OK, thanks. <clears throat> well, thank you for all attending, and um, welcome to my presentation. As Jennifer noted, it's going to come in two parts, and the first part will discuss the current status and take a look at the possible futures for Giovanni in this year of 2019, and then we'll show the new images that were selected to the Giovin Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. I've contacted some of the authors and received responses, so. Um, some of them know that they've been selected, and I'll talk more about that later. But first of all, I want to um, mention, because I haven't done one of these workshops for a while, um, that is dedicated to Gregory G. Leptuk. And Greg um, was our colleague here at the NASA GS DISC, and he passed away suddenly on January 12, 2012. So just a little bit of background. He um, was a native of Georgia which is the country in Europe and not the state of the United States, though he did work in North Carolina for a while. And he received an MS in theoretical physics and a PhD, degree, PhD in cosmic ray physics from Tbilisi State University in Georgia. And he worked at the Moscow Institute of Theoretical and Experimental Physics, Moscow State University, and the Tbilisi Institute of Physics. And Dr. Leptuk joined the Goddard DAC at the time in 1997 to support the CWIFS data distribution effort um, where he first worked with me, and he followed that up by heading the MODIS data support team. In May 2003, he became the science data manager for the entire GS DISC, which was a position in which he became noted and which he excelled. Dr. Leptuk was a principal investigator for several NASA-supported projects which were related to developing tools to support the advancement of Earth science data access, data fusion, online analysis, and visualization, particularly for atmospheric data. His most recent research interests had included multi-sensor and multi-data intercomparison, and data quality and provenance and how to convey that to users, um, aerosol data fusions, and the design and development of online data analysis tools such as Giovanni. 
Greg was an active member of several different scientific organizations, such as the Federation of Earth Science Information Partners, which is known as ESIP, and coincidentally, they're holding their annual summer meeting right now in Tacoma, Washington. Um, he was also on the GWEX aerosol panel and the Earth Science Data System Working Group. Um, at the annual American Geophysical Union fall meeting each year, they now hold the Leptuk Lecture on Earth and Space Science Informatics. Interestingly, this morning at the ESIB meeting, Dawn Wright of Esri, who was a previous Leptuk Lecture recipient, um, gave, a, gave a talk that I listened to by, by um, live streaming. So Giovanni was one of Greg's passions. Um, we always referred to him as the father of Giovanni. And it was without his skill and dedication and promotion that it would not be um, what it has become today. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. OK, so where exactly is Giovanni in 2019? OK, so looking back, I found that the last time we held a Giovanni workshop was in the fall of 2016. And back at that time, there were 1,351 data variables in the system. And the active release version was version 4.21. And we just surpassed the 2,000 data variable mark. Uh, we're currently at 2,007. And the current data release is 4.30. And the release of version 4.31, which I will talk about in a short time, is just a few days away. This shows what the interface looks now looks like now if you haven't seen it. And you can see that I selected variables from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. OK, so some of the data sets and variables that have been added are data from the Famine Early Warning System Network, which is called FuseNet. And that is in the Land Data Assimilation System data set. And so the short name for that, the short acronym for that, is FLDAS. And then we've also added climatologies from the North American Land Data Assimila Assimilation System, which we call NLDAS. Um, the Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications 2 data set superseded the original MERA data set, so we call it MERA 2. And this has a ton of data variables and maybe one of the main reasons we've gone from 1,300 to 2,000. We've also added in the Global Precipitation Measurement, GPM, Integrated Multi-Satellite Retrievals for GPM, which is iMERGE for short. And then some other variables um, that we've gotten are from the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, which you know collects gravity data, but also is able to detect water movement due to the difference in gravity. And, so therefore, there are some hydrology data variables from GRACE. Um, we have the measurements of pollution in the troposphere instrument data. That's called MOPIT. And that is primarily carbon monoxide data for atmospheric concentrations. And then the FLDAS data set, which I already described, recently added a very pretty data set of global monthly data variables. There's 24 of them. And they are at a um, 0.1 degree spatial resolution. So they look really good in. Uh, Giovanni maps. Now, here are some of the capabilities and plot options that have been added since 2016. The major visualization that wasn't available in 2016 at the time of the, the webinar was the time average overlay map. And what this allows you to do is you can do it with either one or two variables. And you can plot both data values as colors or as contour lines. And so you can plot both for one variable, or you can have one variable expressed as a color and another expressed as a contour. So this is really useful. There are some examples on our website. Um, and you can see how that works. Also added was shapefile support for seasonal interannual time series, which is a very strong capability we have. And the shape file is, rather than using a bounding box, rectangular, you can use a shape of a US state or a country or even a large watershed in the, around the world. We added in polar projections for maps. So you can see the maps either from the 
viewpoint of the North Pole or the South Pole. We had the ability to designate minimum and maximum values for scatter plots and time series, for zonal mean plots, and for Hofmuller plots. And we also added in the color palette options for Hofmuller plots, so you can change the colors like the maps, um, a logarithmic option for our histogram plots, and we also switched over from a pixelated version of Hofmuller plots to a contour display, much more familiar to those who have seen Hofmuller plots in, in other graphics. Okay, so now this is just some highlights from the releases since 4.21. First one I'll show, talk about is 4.21. And I want to really note that this is highlights of things that the user can see, because behind the scenes, our development team has done some really amazing work with software modifications. And they have enabled faster data processing and the handling of many more data requests than previously and so a lot more users can access Giovanni and run their simulate excuse me their visualizations than than before um, and so I want to give credit to them they're, they're sort of the people behind the curtain but they've done a really remarkable job okay release 4.21 added in support for web coverage service also known as WCS release 4.22 put in a single time step option for cross section so you can look at a cross-section for just one time, and also for eight-day data support. And that also that means data not at a monthly or daily level, but in eight-day and also other um, divisions of time, such as even 10-day or 15-day. There's a big variety of those. OK, we added in comma-separated variable output, otherwise known as ASCII text, um, for the interannual time series option. And in 4.24, we added in the Earth data login. And this is something that the DACs have implemented system-wide, and it allows us to know who the users are that um, use the system and contact them if necessary. And there's other things that it can allow us to do potentially. I'll discuss that a little bit more. OK, they changed the way that they did their open searching in at least 4.25, allowing the use of global attributes. And um, in 4.26, the plot options that I described in the previous slide were added, the color options for a lot more of the plots. And so in 4.27, um, they were able to use temporal resolution as a criteria in the Giovanni search in addition to other ways of searching for data. Um, release 4.28, we changed the look of the interface. Um, the help and feedback buttons were put in the toolbar. Um, feedback is very important if you're using it. If there's an error, if you don't get a plot, you can click feedback and send a message directly to our help desk, and that can be diagnosed. And it also adds in the session that you were doing it so we can take a quick look at it. Um, it was a small little thing, but it was important. The bounding box I was going to just point out was the um, – Giovanni guest mode. And the reason that the Giovanni guest mode was put in was so you didn't, as a new user, you don't have to come in and get credentials like a password and username to try out Giovanni. But it does have only limited capabilities. OK, and then the most recent release, um, rather than using decimal coordinates for latitude and longitude, you can now use EWNNS for east, west, north, and south. And it also allows the the um, deletion of caption titles, which can make it easier to put just the figure into a paper and then put your own caption on it, or leave it uncaptioned um, as a figure, that, um, so you can put the caption underneath it in the text of the paper. So after all that, um, I want to talk a little bit about version 4.31. And version 4.31, which we'll have available in just a few days, includes a thing that was called persistent session. And this was recommended by our own GS Disk advisory group of scientists and, and users. And what this basically means is that someone that's used Giovanni and has generated some results will not use their work if the Giovanni analysis session is interrupted, sort of like my phone just got interrupted. Okay, the system itself will save previous analysis results. And this will result in a significant change to the user experience. So be ready for that. OK, so we say that there's three different scenarios, which I have on this slide, for persistent session. 
and you note that you will have to have generated at least one result before this you'll see persistent sessions work. Okay, so say in the first case, um, the browser is used to go to another website. You looked at a time series and there was a big, big spike of rain and you don't know what event caused that. And so you decide, I'm gonna go look at my favorite weather data site and see what was happening that day. Um, you do that, and if you've done that the way the system works now, you can see that this is what happens. If you come back to Giovanni, your results will be gone. Now, with persistent sessions, the results will still be there. We call that the back button scenario. Now, the second scenario is if the browser was closed either purposefully or accidentally. And this is particularly useful if your computer system suddenly requires a restart, such as for a necessary update. And this actually happened to me when I was testing persistent sessions on our test bed. And so when the browser restarts after your computer restarts, you will see the Giovanni interface page, and there's a button that says go to results next to the plot data button, the bright green button. You click on that, and all the results that you had already made are still going to be there. Okay, and I also want to point out, when you look at it, there's a little X next to each result. Um, for lack, I mean, if you've generated 15 results and the first five weren't what you were looking for, you can delete them to keep track. Okay, so I call this the go home for the day scenario um, because you can go home, turn your system off, turn your browser off, come back, restart, get the browser up, and Giovanni will be right where you left it. Okay, and then the final scenario is for bookmarking. Currently, if you take a bookmark after you have put in your time criteria and your bounding box or shape file and selected the data, that's all that the bookmark keeps. So you can send this to other people or do it yourself, and then if you click on that bookmark, you will just get where the session begins. You still have to click plot data. Now, if you, the bookmark, if you do it from the results page, will save the information for the results. Click on the bookmark and everything that you had under that bookmark will be there. Now, there is a caveat, okay? This is based on system resources for memory. So the current window for availability in persistent sessions is going to be three to seven days, and that depends on system demand. There may be likely more during the work week, more results generated than over the weekend, and so the persistent sessions may last longer over the weekend than during the week. There are looking at scenarios in which there could be virtually unlimited storage of analysis results or at least regeneration of analysis results. Okay, now I'm just going to take a quick look at our Giovanni publication count. We feel that one of the best ways to judge how um, Giovanni has been used is to look at the papers that have appeared in peer-reviewed journals. Okay, and so it was, first became available in 2003, and in 2004 we saw three papers. Okay, as you can see, there's been a pretty substantial growth um, since 2013. We have seen over 200 papers every year. Um, the graphic, which was prepared for last year's AGU meeting, shows 203 in December, but we found a few more, because that was in mid-December, and ended up with 208. Now, at the end of May, we were averaging about 16 a month. Um, which was a total of 80 publications. But yesterday afternoon, I put together the count for June, and they kept coming. And so we actually ended up with 22 papers um, that, that appeared. And I will point out, too, that um, I always list them as soon as they appear, because some of the journal, in, journals in which they appeared are on October 2019. But the Internet being what it is now, these publications appear online sometimes several months before their official publication date. So there's 22. At the end of the year, I'll put out a list of all the publications. And some of these publications that we have seen in 2019 are the source of some of the images that you'll see in the Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. Okay, so now I want to talk just briefly about what future may hold for Giovanni. Okay, one of the main things that we're targeting on is the user experience and the ease of use for Giovanni. We don't have any major new visualization ideas. Um, that's something the user community might suggest, but hold on a second because we'll show you what else um, Giovanni's doing. So one of the things we're considering is how to integrate Giovanni within the entire GS Disk website. Okay, because right now it's a separate website. We want to potentially make it easier to find, easier to use, perhaps easier to access other 
data types within the GS disk. Okay, small thing, but now I'd like to make it possible for the um, map that you create when you're selecting an area or a shape file to be downloaded as a download. Right now, you'd have to screen capture it um, with some other utility. Um, that would be easier. It would also probably make it easier to put that figure into a paper. This is really important sometimes because a time series does not show you the area selected. And there are areas of the world where you could have a bounding box that shows no boundaries of any countries and no coastline. And so it's a good idea to have a map that shows you where the bounding box is. OK. We have created definitions for all of the variables that are listed under our measurements facet. I think there are something around 80 measurements there. And so people have asked what some of them are. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are. And so we have definitions. We're going to link them up. And you can click on it and see what that measurement means. We're continuing to work on our outreach, uh, our video options for tutorials, just showing a way around. We'll probably have a video tutorial showing how persistent sessions work when that becomes available. And then one thing that um, has been asked for, it's something that the Earth Data Login enables, but it's also a little bit more implementation heavy, is um, making it possible to save all of your preferences. Uh, you come up with a color palette that's perfect for the data analysis you're doing. You want it always to be the one that shows up when you start working. That's something that's being looked at as well. OK, and then this is something people have asked about, and this is something we're looking at. And this is Cloud Giovanni. Now, the implementation of Giovanni in a cloud computing environment is currently being developed. And we'll go into a limited testing mode soon. Now, if you're familiar with cloud computing, you might be able to envision what some of the advantages are of putting Giovanni into a cloud computing environment could be. And so here are some of the ones that um, we've thought about. One is that there are markedly faster data processing times. Um, if you do a really long time series with hourly data, which is one of the tests we sometimes run on Giovanni, it can take a few minutes. With the cloud computing environment, it can be done in seconds. Okay, and along with that comes the ability to analyze much larger data volume. Data is coming online. We know there's instruments with increased temporal resolution, increased spatial resolution, basically bigger data densities. A cloud Giovanni can do that faster and make make it look nice and easy. OK. It also enables the side-by-side -side analysis of data from our archives with data potentially coming from other organizations, such as European Space Agency or NOAA, um, and there's probably several others. OK. And so now if, if that data is in the cloud, then you could potentially use Giovanni to work with those data sets and generate um, graphics with both of them. OK, and it also enables something people have asked about, asked about at the last meeting I was at. What about a data set I've made? OK, well, if you can put it in the cloud in the right format, it should be able to work with Giovanni in the cloud as well. OK. Um, I just mentioned that, hey, maybe there's a really good analysis option that um, can be applied. Well, it's possible to put that analysis option in a different way, a different type of graphic into a cloud Giovanni environment. And finally, um, you, can direct, you, can, you can do machine learning algorithms. Next week, um, our presenter is Guido Cervoni of Penn State University. He's done some of this as well. He's going to talk about um, this. The last point that I've made is that you can connect Giovanni to um, other statistical analysis package directly. So you can say, OK, well, Giovanni, when you're done, put that data into this MATLAB and do the, run the script that I wrote for that. And, generate all your results. Now you have to get the output result, download it, and put it into your package on your own system. So there's a lot of potential there. It's obviously very exciting. And we'll continue to see what happens as it gets developed. Okay, I'm going to take a very short break to get, catch my breath and get a drink. And then we'll move on to part two. OK, <clears throat> now, part two is about the new images that we have selected for the Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. And today, I'm only going to present a brief description of each image 
and tell you the paper in which it was featured. And then in a couple of weeks, um, the next issue of the Giovanni News will show a little bit more about our rationale for selecting these particular figures. The full citation to the paper is going to be provided there. And I also note that we have printable certificates that can be sent to the authors. And I'll also send them a copy of the Giovanni News as well. This first image is from a paper by Gui et al. And that was entitled Water Vapor Variation and the Effect of Aerosols in China, published in the journal Atmospheric Environment. And their figure nine shows correlation coefficients of precipitable water vapor and temperature over China for all four seasons and annually. And this uses the correlation map capability that's in Giovanni, which is not one of its most used options, that being the most used options are data maps and time series, but this is very powerful and really gives you more insight into the connections between the data. Okay, this selected image is from Begum et al. And the paper was, excuse me, simulation and analysis of synoptic scale dust storms over the Arabian Peninsula. And it was also published, it was, excuse me, it was published in Atmospheric Research. And the image shows a comparison of satellite remotely sensed dust products for dust storms over the Arabian Peninsula. Shamer is a model, and that's some of the data. And then <clears throat> UMETSAT is a, is a weather satellite. And you can see data from MODIS and from OMI. And there's some nice correlations and differences between the what you can discern from each of these data types. I want to note that there was a similar figure looking at other occurrences of dust storms. So, um, Bigo et al. made great use of Giovanni. OK, this paper is by Noda et al. <clears throat> and it's entitled, A Preliminary Survey of Zoantherian Endosymbionts Shows High Genetic Variation Over Small Geographic Scales on Okinawa Jima Island, Japan. And this was from the journal Pier J. And it used sea surface temperature from Giovanni. You can see the, the color map is the sea surface temperature data. OK, now, the term symbiotic algae may be one that's more familiar to you than zoantherian endosymbionts. And I just have a little picture here, because what they are is the algal cells that live symbiotically with coral. And it seems like they become most famous when the corals become environmentally stressed and the corals release these endosymbiotic cells, and this is what's called a coral bleaching event, because they are photosynthetic, they have chlorophyll, they're green, and when the corals release them, the corals turn white. Now, Kokar and Yasmin provided this figure, and this was from a book chapter. The book chapter was entitled, Investigating the Aerosol Type and Spatial Distribution During Winter Fog Conditions Over the Indo-Gangetic Plains. And it was in the book entitled, Land Atmospheric Research Applications in, South, in Southeast Asia. And so what they did with Giovanni was make a winter average for humidity and for temperature data from the atmospheric infrared sounder, which we call AIRS, and also wind data from the MERA-2 model. And this may have been done back when it was just MERA data. Sometimes it takes a couple of years to get your research paper published. The final plot is not from Giovanni. It just shows different land cover classifications. And this is a remarkable figure um, because it has several different things shown at the same time. And this is from Cavaliero et al. And the paper is entitled, Insulation Forcing of Coccolithophore Productivity in the North Atlantic During the Middle Pleistocene. And it was in a journal named Quaternary Science Reviews. And what it shows from Giovanni is the time series of chlorophyll concentrations in the North Atlantic Ocean for three separate locations. And the three, the three separate locations in the figure in the map are the blue square in the north, the black star in the center, and the red square to the south. And below that, B, C, and D show both an annual average in color, excuse me, a multi-year average in color, and each year of data in gray lines. So this shows you the difference in the timing of the blooms that happen seasonally here. It's different by location. And this particular paper is not about 
what was happening in the present, but was happening in the middle Pleistocene. And so the major study is looking at the core that was obtained at the site of the black star. So it really is interesting. It shows a lot of different data here, and also shows the variety of different data, excuse me, different research that Giovanni can be used to contribute to. This paper is from Salmabadi and Saidi, and their paper was, in, excuse me, this figure was from Salmabadi and Saidi. Their paper was entitled Determination of the Transport Routes of and the Areas Potentially Affected by SO2 Emanating from the Katunabad Copper Smelter in the Kerman Province of Iran Using High Split. Now, this appeared in the journal Atmospheric Pollution Research, and it clearly shows sulfur dioxide concentration, concentrations around Iran, and you can definitely see the location of a copper smelter. Um, copper smelting happens to be a major source of anthropogenic human emissions of sulfur dioxide. And it's also possible to make a map globally and pinpoint each of the copper smelter operations around the world. And in fact, another figure that we considered was, did exactly that. Okay, and this particular data, the sulfur dioxide data, is from the ozone measuring instrument, excuse me, ozone monitoring instrument, which is called OMI for short. But this figure we noted for special recognition because we have never seen before a three-dimensional depiction of data taken from Giovanni and used in a three-dimensional figure like this. Okay. Al Salihi performed a characterization of aerosol characterization of aerosol type based on aerosol optical properties over Baghdad, Iraq. And so this paper was published in the Arabian Journal of Geosciences. And the three data types that were used are aerosol index, angstrom exponent, and aerosol optical depth. And you can see by the color coding that by doing it this way, several different aerosol types were characterized and separated, essentially, in this 3D plot. So it's a really neat plot and um, a great idea. Now, Kruger et al. in the paper, Intrapopulation Variability of the Non-Breeding Distribution of Southern Giant Petrels, Macronectes Giganteus, is mediated by individual body size, was in the journal Antarctic Science. And they used several different ocean and weather variables which are shown in figure one of this ornithological study. Um, the figures from Giovanni, they got sea surface temperature and chlorophyll. They also made a sea surface temperature gradient map, and they also used wind speed. Okay, they also have several other data types. And panel H shows the actual distribution of the non-breeding giant petrels as they go back and forth between the Antarctic Peninsula and Tierra del Fuego. And I put in a picture of what a southern giant petrel looks like. Now, this figure is both eye-catching and informative. And we also noted this for special recognition because it was a great use of Giovanni. Bedoya Soto et al. had a paper entitled Seasonal Shift of the Diurnal Cycle of Rainfall over Medellin's Valley, Central Andes of Colombia from 1998 through 2005. And this is in Frontiers in Earth Science. And they have nine different variables that were acquired from Giovanni shown in separate Hovmuller plots. In this figure, they also showed the location of the adjacent valleys, which have different environmental characteristics. And these are designated by the parallel black and red lines. And you can see much of this data is from MERA2. So it's a assimilated model generated figure. Okay, And there is some regularity in a model result compared to a actual physical data result, such as is shown in 7i, which is precipitation data from TRIM. But this really shows some great continuity. It shows a connection and big disparity between the, the valleys that are different altitudes. Um, it's a really remarkable figure. Um, so we noted it for special recognition. Now, this is another Hovmuller diagram. And this is actually for just the month of March 2018. And this is from the paper by Cascoitis et al. Analysis of Intense Dust Storms Over the Eastern Mediterranean in March 2018, Impact on Radiative Forcing in Athens Air Quality, 
and that was in the journal Atmospheric Environment. Dr. Keskoitis is a frequent user of Giovanni. We've known him for several years, and he has actually participated in previous of these Giovanni online workshops. Now, this particular paper, excuse me, this figure shows several noteworthy dust outbreaks, and it even shows you in the rectangles where they occur. Okay. Now, you'll note in the upper right that there were dust storms over the Black Sea. Well, these dust storms actually went further than the Black Sea, and they actually put orange tinged snow, they caused orange tinged snow to fall in the mountains of Eastern Europe. And this was an unusual occurrence that became the subject of many news articles. And so here's a picture of the orange snow. Um, Margarita Alcina took this picture. And so there were several news articles about it. Um, it showed up really clearly in remote sensing imagery, some of which you could see on NASA Worldview. And we even wrote an article about it as well on our website, which you can take a look for. So um, it's a great figure, and it was a very interesting geophysical event. Now, Rebideau and his colleagues have studied cholera outbreaks, outbreaks in Haiti for several years, and they have used Giovanni in previous papers. This paper was Epidemiological and Molecular Forensics of Cholera Recurrence in Haiti, and that was published in Scientific Reports. And in this paper, this figure, they show daily rainfall and temperature data, and that's in the top, and then B and C show cholera occurrence reports. And you can clearly see um, there's a big difference in the amount of rainfall between the dry season and the wet season. Now, cholera is a waterborne disease, and so there is a very clear connection between the rainfall timing and the cholera outbreak occurrences. Okay, and it's also interesting to know that one stage in the development of the bacteria that causes cholera is carried by zooplankton. And so previously, chlorophyll data from water bodies has been used to investigate the outbreaks of cholera. So there's many different ways that you can use Giovanni to take a look at this. And um, hopefully, and as been described in some papers, it can be used to actually mitigate cholera or even prevent it. OK, and the last selection is also related to public health. And we always like it um, when Giovanni is used for public health. And um, I wrote a chapter in a book that should be coming out this year about just that, how you can use different types of data in Giovanni for public health. This paper by Prabhuadel is the investigation of the source, morphology, and trace elements associated with atmospheric PM10 and human health risks due to inhalation of carcinogenic elements at Deiradon, an Indo-Himalayan city. And this was in SN Applied Sciences. The figure shows aerosol optical depth from MODIS, average for the winter and the summer. And that's on the right. And then on the left, there are figures showing emission sources and air mass trajectories on the left. So this is a great deal of information is in this nice, concise figure. And I think this is another example of how powerful Giovanni makes researchers, gives them access to a lot of data, free of charge, as it, as it always been, and allows the con conduct of research like this. So this completes our presentation of the newly selected images for the Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. So as I noted earlier, all of these images will be in the next issue of the Giovanni News, uh, which becomes available on our website. But if you want to get it earlier than that, you can subscribe to the Giovanni News mailing list. Um, it's a very simple process that I show here on the, on the slide, and I think we can make that information available afterwards as well. Okay, so that's about all I have, and I want to thank you for listening and participating in our fourth Gregory G. Leptuk online Giovanni workshop, and I am open for any questions. Hey, thank you, Jim. Before we do that, let's go ahead and transition to our final set of polling questions. And we'll give these about three minutes or so, and then from there we'll transition directly to the Q&A. And during this afternoon's Q&A, my colleague Joshua Blumenfeld will moderate, and uh, I'll address any inquiries in the Q&A pod. All right, everybody, let's give these just uh, three minutes or so, and then we'll move to the Q&A session. All right, thanks, everybody.
Okay, we're going to give this just a few more seconds and then we'll transition to our question and answer period. Okay, if anybody has any questions, please enter those into the Q&A pod. At the moment, I don't see any, but while we're waiting, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that um, Dr. Acker's presentation is available for download. You'll find that in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you click on the file name, uh, you'll be prompted with an option to download the presentation. All right, let's take a look here. I'll also point out that I'm, I will put the subscription information for the Giovanni News <clears throat> on our NASA Giovanni Twitter, which is shown on this slide. So um, you can find it there. And one thing I'll note, um, the one of the suggestions for future webinars was how to use Giovanni data with R. That's going to be the subject of next week's webinar given by Guido Cervone. Um, he uses it, he um, gets his undergraduates at Penn State to actually um, use Giovanni output with R. So definitely tune in next week for that. Does anybody have any questions? This might be the first webinar ever. I'm obviously a very comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what we'll, we'll, we'll take a, another look here. We'll give it another minute, but if there are no questions, what we'll do is we'll leave the virtual meet, meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so. Um, if you think of something, feel free to jot that into the Q&A pod. And otherwise, uh, Jennifer, we do have, pardon me, we do have a question. Uh, is Grace data available in Giovanni? Yeah, just the um, hydrology variables. There's three different hydrology variables that are um, from Grace. We don't have gravity data. It might be interesting to have gravity data in Giovanni, but we don't. Sorry. <laughs> And another question, Jim. Uh, what is the difference between L2 and L3? Um, L2 is level 2 data, and level 2 is normally available in the satellite swath format. Um, not always satellite swath. That's sort of how I think of it is um, my familiarity was with satellites that cr collected data as it orbited over the Earth in a, a scanning swath that could be, you know, sometimes very narrow or sometimes as much as 1,500 kilometers wide. So that's how the data collects it. It's usually collected that way at a higher spatial resolution than the map data, which is gridded, put into a specific format, and that's the type of data that Giovanni uses. Now, the G GS Disk has also developed a level two data subsetter that is accessible, and we're continuing to add and apply that to many different data sets. Um, it's not something um, we could do real well with Giovanni because Giovanni averages data. And you can sometimes see if you do a daily data type with swath data, um, you can see gaps between the orbits because it's, it's gridded that way. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the figures um, from Begum et al., you could actually see a data, uh, the break between the swaths um, happened right over the dust storm. So um, L2 data is not something that you can easily put into Giovanni. Potentially, you could process it yourself at a high resolution and make a data set that Giovanni could use, and that's something that um, Cloud Giovanni could potentially work with. Thank you for the question. And thank you, Jim, for the answer. This is obviously not Jennifer Brennan. This is her co-host, Josh Blumenfeld, talking. If you have any more questions, please type them into the Q&A pod. Works just like a chat. I also saw, um, happen to note, um, 
one of our participants is from Mexico, and one of the questions was applications to agriculture, and um, actually made a figure for a um, seminar a few months ago using the new FLDAS global climatology, at monthly climatologies at 0.1 degree, and it, it you really can get down um, into um, agricultural level, um, at least in a re on a regional basis with that data. And because it's hydrological data, it gives you some really good insight, um, particularly for those, those topics. Okay, well at this point, if there are no further questions, we will leave the virtual meeting space open for an additional 10 minutes and log off from the audio component. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And remember, too, that this will be recorded and you can show it to your friends. Okay. Bye-bye. Seeing that all right, thanks. Thanks everybody.